Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. This is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week was the most senior judge in the land and to her name she has a string of firsts from being the first person at her North Yorkshire school to go to Cambridge to read law to being the first female president of the Supreme Court. And there's a string of astonishing accomplishments along the way, which she has written about now that she has stepped down from her formal duties. And it is called Spider Woman by Lady Hale. And of course, Spider Woman refers to that famous spider brooch that she wore when reading the judgment that said that the decision to prorogue Parliament during all the Brexit shenanigans had been unlawful. And and many people thought that there was something very complex in the choice of the brooch, but apparently not, Lady Hale. Welcome. Well, hello, and it's good to be with you. Apparently not, definitely not. I have a large collection of brooches, which originally started to liven up the dark suits I had to wear uh, when I was a High Court judge. And uh, most of them are creatures of some sort, a lot of frogs, a lot of butterflies, a lot of dragonflies, and a, a few spiders and bees and beetles and things. They migrate to a particular garment, which is where they live. And so the choice of brooch rather depends on the choice of garment. And obviously that day I was going to choose a little black dress, wasn't I? That's what you do in that sort of situation. But that particular little black dress was home to a spider, hence the spider. Never crossed my mind that anybody might read anything into it. Really? I mean, I, I, I mean I've heard you tell, telling that story now a couple of times and I, I keep thinking... Really? I mean, did you really not look at it and go, I mean, I choose ties every day for the news. And, you know, there are days when I go, ooh, I wonder if that's right for the news today. No, I'm afraid I really (laughs) didn't. Of course, I don't think I'd anticipated quite the level of public uh, interest there would be in that judgment in any event. That, uh, of course, was was wrong. (laughs) This podcast is normally where I I get to ask people about their passions and their beliefs and their political ideals and where it all came from and how they were formed. But I think we should, you know, for the sake of transparency, explain to listeners and viewers that we can't really have that kind of conversation, can we? Could Could you explain why? Well, judges are not political animals. We are not party politicians. We are not selected in this country because of our party politics. I don't, in fact, know Uh, the party political affiliations of my fellow justices. One or two cases I could make a very good guess, but I don't actually know. And we try and put all political considerations out of our minds when we are doing our judging. We are trying to judge in accordance with our judicial oath, which is to do justice to all manner of people after the laws and usages of this realm without fear or favor, affection or ill will. And that includes political affections and ill will. As I said in the introduction, I mean, you you have a string of firsts to your name in terms of your achievements and accomplishments as the first female, whatever it might be. And we'll go through some of them during the course of the conversation. And I just wonder why, why, first of all, why you think you have done this? Why you? (laughs) Well, (laughs) I really don't know why me. I did happen to be in the right place at the right time. After all, I'm so old that I'm of the generation where there were plenty of first woman opportunities to be had. And so if you were a possible appointee to said first women appointments, that you stood quite a good chance. That's certainly the case with things like the Law Commission and uh, long overdue in the case of the law laws where I was the first woman. So now I think there was a large element of right place at the right time. But your, your life, I suppose, began from quite a young age with, with I suppose, a certainty that you would, you would have a career. And that was a sort of a necessity, wasn't it? Well, it was taken for granted in my family that we would go to uh, university if we possibly could. And obviously, such a small percentage of the young women uh, in my generation went to university that 
uh, you couldn't take it for granted that you would go, but it was taken for granted that we would go if we could. A privilege, if you like, of coming from a family of teachers. But also, I think my younger sister and I definitely wanted to have our own independent careers so that we would never be wholly dependent upon anybody else, whether it was our parents or whether it was our uh, partners or husbands, uh, because we lost our father when my younger sister was 12 and I was 13. And looking back, I think that the realisation that the rug could suddenly be pulled from under you and was only put back under you uh, by the fact that our mother had teaching qualifications and was able uh, to dust them down and go back to work. That, I think, uh, made us both want to have independent careers of our own. So why did you choose the law? Well, what I say usually as a joke is that I chose the law because my headmistress did not think I was clever enough to read history. And she was an Oxford historian, so she ought to know. But basically what she said was that she didn't think I was a natural historian, although it was my favourite subject at school. And could we think of something else that I might apply to Oxford and Cambridge for? Um, She came up with economics, which I didn't fancy. And uh, I came up with law, which I did. And when you got there, I mean, one of the things like you sort of pick up in the book is you really don't like public school boys, do you? And I suppose... (laughs) (laughs) Oh, not as a... That's not a general uh, proposition. Uh, It's some public school boys. Because obviously most of my friends uh, at Cambridge and most of my colleagues... um, certainly uh, since I became a judge, have been public school boys. And most of them I have very much liked and admired. So, no, I don't think it's quite right to put it that way. But what I didn't like, and I don't think I was alone in this, was the particular sort of public school boy of which there were quite a few when I was in Cambridge. I'm not sure they are so prevalent now um, because entry is so much more competitive. But there were young men there who had gone to schools where it was taken for granted that they would go to Oxford or Cambridge. There was often a special relationship between their school and one of the colleges. uh, And it was also taken for granted that they would go into um, big jobs, uh, usually in the city of London or, or at the bar or whatever. And I found some of those really quite irritating. How sexist... Or how did you overcome the sexism of the law that you must have encountered? Well, I expect I did encounter it, but you know, I've got a certain sort of carry on regardless attitude uh, to things. And so, I mean, we were aware when I went to Cambridge that were, there were very few girls there. And uh, most of us didn't feel entitled. We felt privileged. Uh, and so we got on with enjoying it. Uh, and there was a lot of fun to be had out of a sex ratio that was nine young men to one young woman had its advantages despite the injustice of it all. Do you think the the trajectory of your career though was determined also to some degree by your by your sex Um, in in that you know rather than going into the bar and practicing you went into academia and then to the law commission and so on and you know and went through that route. I, I agree with you my sex did have something to do with it in that I uh, applied for a scholarship uh, to an inn of court when I was in my first year at university. At that stage, did not feel that the bar would be a very welcoming place to somebody like me with no connections, no money. But I still hankered after the bar. So when I graduated, I went off to teach law at Manchester University. And the reason for choosing Manchester instead of Bristol was that Manchester had a thriving local bar and they wanted me to qualify as a barrister and practice while I was teaching. And in those days, it was possible to do that. And so I did that for a few years uh, before finally concentrating on the academic life. But you are right. One of the reasons for concentrating on the academic life uh, was that, that my husband and I wanted to have a child or at least a family, preferably more than one child. And it was easy to see that it was much easier to combine academic life with 
having a child than it was to combine life at the general provincial common law bar where you never knew what you might be doing from one day to the next. Can I also just take you back to what you were just saying about the um, the diversity of where the bar or barristers get drawn from? I mean, how accessible do you think being a barrister is now? You know, tra- traditionally, you know, you didn't have to be privileged and from a great university and all the rest of it to be a barrister. Now you have to get into all sorts, you know, you have a tremendous amount of debt, huge amounts of investment with no guarantee of getting a job. And it puts a lot of people off. Well, it's amazing how many people it doesn't put off. The demand for uh, places on bar courses is extremely high. And I am struck by the huge diversity of people whom I meet, the students that I meet when I go to different universities, because I do try and go to as many universities as I can. And again, a great diversity of gender, obviously, ethnicity, also obviously, and increasingly of uh, background, family, socioeconomic, uh, educational background. I'm amazed at how courageous young people are today, being prepared to take on all that debt through their university courses and then add to it the debt uh, incurred when qualifying uh, for the bar. But do you think they are getting through? Are those people you talk about from all sorts of universities and all sorts of backgrounds, then getting the pupillages and the places in chambers to the right degree? Or do you think it needs to be modernised a bit more? Well, I'm fairly sure that uh, there is a way to go in making it a genuinely uh, level playing field because there is a falling off, certainly of, of young women at each stage, a slight falling off in the proportion Uh, And I suspect, though I haven't checked the figures recently, forgive me, that the same will be true with people from ethnic minorities. All of the inns do as much as they possibly can to provide scholarships for people who would not otherwise be able to go to the bar. But I remember noticing that uh, among the criteria, it said, well, look for a good degree from a Russell Group University. So I said, I don't think you should be privileging Russell Group universities. Uh, they're not necessarily any better in their legal education than other universities. And they are known to be disproportionate in their admission of people from more privileged backgrounds. And, you know, there are some legal recruiters who are going in for blind application forms so that they don't know the gender or the ethnicity or the age of the person. I don't know how well that works, but I think there is quite a lot going on. The people who recognise that there's a problem and the profession needs to do as much as it possibly can to overcome it. But overall, do you think, you know, even more senior, you know, higher up the legal profession when it comes to the appointment of judges and uh, and those senior appointments, are we open enough? Are we meritocratic enough? Or are we still stuck in a time where, you know, opaque decisions get ha- get taken in mysterious ways and nobody can really explain it? No, we're not stuck in in the world as it used to be. Certainly for judicial appointments now, they used all to be done on the old tap on the shoulder method. The Lord Chancellor's officials would approach people with the proposition that they might become judge. And that is no longer the case. Obviously, more open and transparent appointments processes started at the bottom and worked their way up. But now we have an independent Judicial Appointments Commission, which sets out its criteria, devises its own um, application and assessment processes, and makes the recommendations for all judicial appointments. It's still not perfect. Nobody pretends that it's perfect. There are things that need to be done uh, to improve uh, the diversity of appointments, but they there's loads being done. So it would be a great shame if people got the impression that if they didn't come from a certain walk of life or a certain educational background or with a certain uh, ethnicity, they were not going to uh, be able to make a success. That is just not the case. What about access to justice then? You know, the other side of this, because that's the other thing that's really changed over the course of your career, isn't it? The, The resources available to ordinary people who don't have money to use the law. Let's start, let's keep crime to one side. If you look at dispute resolution, do ordinary people have access to the law anymore? Or is it only the rich? Neither of those. That, that's a false dichotomy, if you um, excuse my saying so. It is the case that for the first part of my professional career, 
access to lawyers was improving because the scope of the legal aid scheme was increasing, expanding to cater for a wider range of subject matters. uh, And it still had reasonably generous eligibility criteria and it still paid the lawyers reasonably well. And then bit by bit, that has been eroded so that whole areas of ordinary everyday legal dispute have been taken out of the scope of public funding. The eligibility criteria are now extremely um, tight, uh, nor are the lawyers paid as well. So it's not in their interest to do publicly funded work unless they're either very idealistic or love it or not, not interested in making huge sums of money. But of course, within that, there will still be people who do qualify because they are very poor and have a dispute which is within scope. And and so they will qualify along with the very rich. It's the ones in the middle that are the real problem. Right. And the ones with disputes that have to do, which have been taken out of scope. Well, what what do those problems lead to? I mean, you know, is there a crisis in terms of access to justice? Well, I don't like to use alarmist language like crisis. The justice system is under enormous pressure. Some of that is because fewer people have access to good legal advice and help at the outset. I mean, one of the really difficult things is that uh, under the previous system, people who couldn't afford it could actually go to a lawyer be told what their legal position was and have a bit of help in solving the problem. Writing a letter, lifting the phone, negotiating with the local authority if the rent was late, explaining the reasons why that and and negotiating a way of dealing with it, similarly with landlords. So it never got near an eviction situation. Well, once that goes, uh, people are in real difficulties. So I agree that's, that's a big problem. Another big problem, of course, is has been the result of COVID. Uh, where traditional ways of holding court processes couldn't happen or had to be adapted very quickly. Uh, And so that has led to backlogs or to less than satisfactory experiences uh, in in some court hearings. Closure of courts. I I come from rural North Yorkshire. There used to be a magistrate's court in the village where I grew up. That was closed, but there was still a magistrate's court in the town where I now live. That was closed and everybody had to go off miles and miles away. That's now been closed and they've got to go off even further. So who is going to want to go and take their dispute to court if they've got one? Uh, Who's going to want to go and give evidence in a criminal case? You know, if it's 70 miles away and there's no public transport. These are problems that the justice system really has to confront to make sure that it is still available for everybody who needs it. I mean, when you say needs to confront, you're, you're talking about a lot of money needs to go into it again, aren't you? I mean, it's, it's, it's mostly about resources. It is mostly about resources. But of course, there's always the question of the efficient use of resources uh, and uh, doing things in a, in a new sort of way. There are places in the world uh, where uh, they have something which they might call a justice bus, you know, a specially adapted vehicle. Uh, that tours the small places with a judge and an official uh, and people can take their their disputes there. Or you can have pop-up courts in in different places. So you don't have have a whole huge court building, but you can have more locally tailored facilities to meet the needs of the local people. So I wouldn't, yes, resources are a problem and I do have some uh, sympathy for uh, more recent secretaries of state for justice who have had to do their best with, after such massive cuts as took place in the justice system nearly 10 years ago. And it's difficult for them to reclaim the resources that were lost then. And, and what is the responsibility of politics and of government in particular to uphold the rule of law and to, and to be seen to be doing that? Well, I think they have to... Um, demonstrate that they understand the importance of the law and the justice system in the running of the country. It's always been, and my predecessor, Lord Newberger, said, the two principal obligations of government 
are security abroad, in other words, <laughs> keeping off one's enemies, and the rule of law at home, respect for the law at home. And those are the two principal obligations of government. After that, of course, there are all sorts of lovely things that people want and are right to want. Uh, but uh, we need a functioning country where the laws operate and operate properly. And so so if a government, and I, I, I'm sort of treading carefully here because I don't want to take us into sort of an area where you'll feel very uncomfortable, but I mean, you have a government where, where that does things sometimes that you know, it says that, that turn out to be unlawful. Is that just sort of the normal thrust of politics and that, you know, it shows the system works when that's pointed out and things have to be then redone? Or are we, you know, or do you think we're in a different environment in some way um, in the last few years? No, I don't think we're in a different environment in the last few years. It has always been uh, the case that the rule of law means that everyone is subject to the law, not only the people who are governed by the law, but the governors. So the government, public authorities have to abide by uh, the law and observe the limits of the powers which the law gives them. And it's been the job of the judges to point that out for centuries. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that got me interested in the law in the first place was the history of the 17th century, uh, where some of the judges, uh, right from the beginning of the 17th century, started pointing out to the king that he couldn't always do what he wanted to do, and that he was governed by the law. And at the end of the 17th century, that was the deal. So I don't think there's anything new about that. That's been going on for ages. Um, the law, of course, has got more complicated. <laughs> you know, and there are more obligations that it, it places on government and so on. Uh, and that obviously makes things uh, more difficult. But it has been going on for a very long time. I don't think it's changed. Um, there have been cases like the prorogation case throughout history. When you delivered that judgment, did you have a sense of history about it? What a nice question. Uh, it, it sounds a bit grandiose, doesn't it? I mean, we knew it was an important case. We knew it was a case we couldn't dodge. Uh, we had to hear it. We had to hear it quickly. We had to decide it quickly. After all, we got the High Court in England saying one thing, you know, that this... That Parliament had been prorogued, they're not going to get into it. Uh, and we got the Court of Session in Scotland saying the complete reverse, uh, that uh, the prorogation had not only been unlawful, but that it was null and void. So Parliament hadn't been prorogued. Now, there's only one UK Parliament, so they couldn't both be right. So we had to choose between the two. So to that extent, it did feel like something uh, quite momentous. And uh, the context, of course, of what we weren't deciding, we were not deciding on Brexit, that had been decided. Our views, whatever they were, and I've no idea what they were, uh, on whether Brexit was a good idea or not a good idea, were completely irrelevant. The questions we were looking at were quite separate from that. But obviously that added to the general sense of drama about the whole thing. And we'd also had the experience of the earlier case brought by Mrs. Miller, the one about um, giving notice under Article 50, which had generated uh, a degree of interest which quite surprised us. So we were prepared for there to be a great deal of interest. I think what we didn't necessarily expect was how much interest there would be in the rest of the Anglo-American common law world. But, but there was a huge amount of interest. I mean, in part, that was because it was on camera as well, wasn't it? Um, and and you could it could be seen around the world. So what do you think of televising courts in general and criminal cases? I'm obviously in favour of um, televising um, Supreme Court proceedings, and they all are, and indeed Court of Appeal proceedings subject to anonymity considerations which have to be borne in mind. I'm not myself in favour of televising witness proceedings. It's, a, it's very difficult giving evidence. It is very nerve wracking, unless you're a professional witness, uh, and most people aren't. And the object of witness actions, whether they're criminal trials, civil or family cases, is to try and get at the truth. And so we want the witnesses to be doing their best or to, or to be exposed when they're not doing their best. Uh, and I don't think a further distraction like cameras, like the 
fact that possibility that things being broadcast throughout the country, if not around the world, is going to help people give of their best in the witness box. I really don't. And there's an additional problem with jury trials, because obviously if you've got a jury and the jury is not supposed to talk to anybody else about the case, the jury is supposed to listen to the evidence and make up their own minds independently. Now, that's hard enough to do even when the case is not being televised. But imagine going home as a juror and your partner or children have been watching the television all day. It'd be really very hard for them not to say, oh, that person was obviously lying, or what on earth did you think of that, but, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it would make it even more difficult for the jurors to do what they're supposed to do. There is a problem in family cases, and that is identification. And you will find that most of the research shows that the children who are involved in family cases are very uncomfortable, even with anonymized judgments being given uh, because they are worried uh, about jigsaw identification. In a lot of cases, it would be possible to put two and two together and work out who somebody is. And they're also worried about the intimate details of their family lives uh, being available you know, on the internet. So we have concerns about um, cases involving children uh, and the harm that it may do them. Although <laughs> We understand there is a need for as much transparency as we can possibly manage. Well, what effect do you think a lifetime of taking these sorts of decisions, taking children away from parents, taking property away from people sometimes, or sending people to jail? I mean, not, not necessarily in your particular case, but my father was a magistrate and he sat on the family bench and he used to tell me how dreadful he felt about care orders and things like that. And he stopped doing it after a while because he couldn't really bear it. I just wonder, sort of, when you get to the end of a career and you've you, your decisions have been so important to so many people and they've changed the course of so many other people's lives, that's a tremendous responsibility to have lived with, isn't it? Mm. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, and it is rather like being a doctor that you have to try and combine an, an empathy for the people whose lives you are interfering in so that you can understand them and where they're coming from with a detachment so that you can then stand back and take uh, the objectively correct decision as to, as to what to do. But I, I wouldn't say that it's easy. And, and I think many family judges do find a continuous diet of especially child care cases uh, a great strain. I think it's necessary for judges to have as much variety in their diet as possible so that uh, they can do something that doesn't impose that kind of um, burden upon the judge alongside the things that do. You, you, you talk about being detached. and I mean, and the book in a way is, is, is also quite, it's very measured and it's almost sort of, it's sort of dispassionate in, in a way. And um I wonder whether that's you now as a result of a life in the law or is there a real you that you're hiding that you have to keep away from us? You know, where you, you go and rail about your opinions on things and politics and people and all the rest of it. I mean, are you hiding that away from us or is this you? <laughs> well, if you think about it, having been uh, at first uh, well, a barrister, then uh, an academic uh, and then a public servant and then a judge, these are pretty measured sort of occupations, aren't they? Uh, so you do have to be quite a thoughtful person and you have to take a certain amount of care about what you say. And it's only when I, from time to time, uh, go off piste and say things that I maybe uh, surprise people uh, that I've got into trouble. So that just makes one <laughs> even more cautious about what one says. But I do hope, you know, I've got a sense of humour uh, I do find it possible to laugh at myself as well as at other people. Uh, and, uh, and I've got a family and friends who definitely don't let me get uh, above myself. But you may be right about the measured tone and the uh, slight distance from certain types of issue. There's, there's a very sharp intake of breath, I think, for the reader, right at the end of your, your book, where you talk about your personal circumstances um, and the death of your husband. Um, rather suddenly 
and I, and I suppose that has left you in a place um, t- quite unexpected at, at this point in your life. That's true. That's true. And uh, we all thought he'd live forever. Uh, you know, he was one of those people who didn't have a thing wrong with him. And then poof, off he went. So, yes, it's a great big, big hole. And um, the whole family has to learn to live without the person whom we most admired and respected and loved. But, of course, you do. You find ways of, of coping with that um, and uh, ways of moving forward. And and it, it, that moment in the book instantly took me back to your writing about your mother and perhaps not considering at the time how she had felt about losing her husband. Yes. Well, I think children are really very self-centred. and all, Although we knew that our mother was very upset, we too were very upset. And so uh, I think uh, it was hard for us to understand the depth of her feeling at, at the time. Um, but I, I do quote in the book a little story that she wrote um, afterwards, which made it very clear how she was feeling. And um, I now understand exactly, or much more clearly than I did when I was 13, how she was feeling. If you could change the world in any way, what would you do? Oh, the trouble is there are so many things to do, aren't there? Uh, if I would change the world in this country, uh, there are two things I would do, one of which is have a functioning justice system, uh, and the other of which would be taking seriously the obligation in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, which is that in any decision which affects children, the best interests of the child shall be uh, a primary, not the primary, but a primary consideration. Just putting the interests of children nearer the top of decision-making generally uh, would be the way I would want to change the world in this country and indeed everywhere else. Could I just unpack those two things very briefly then? I mean, it's quite shocking to hear you say to have a functioning justice system would be to change the world? Well, we talked earlier about the things that are are not at present functioning properly. We have a functioning justice system. Um, You see, that's, I wasn't measured enough, was I, in the way I put that? Uh, We have a functioning justice system. It's just not functioning as well as it should function in order to give everybody who needs and deserves it access to justice. So, that's that's what I mean by that. And, and and in terms of the rights of the child, could you give me an example of how that would change things? Again, I'm going to have to be quite measured about this. We had um, some cases in the Supreme Court which challenged the uh, benefit cap and the revised benefit cap because of the effect upon children, basically. Uh, the cap on the total amount of benefit that any household could have meant that if you were a a household living in high rent accommodation with several children, you are not going to have what the state said was enough to live on. Uh, And this was attacked as being discriminatory uh, against women and against children. It was generally agreed that it was discriminatory (laughs) against women and against children, but the majority of the court held that it was justified, uh, that it was for the government to make up its mind uh, and put it through Parliament, uh, and that it was not for us uh, to interfere. Now, I have every sympathy and understanding for that point of view. It's uh, it's an entirely um, uh, justifiable point of view. Uh, But because we have signed up to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which does require the interests of the children to be a priority. Some of us, I wasn't alone, thought that these decisions had not given enough priority to the interests of the children who were the sufferers from these decisions. Um, And so I I would really, really like uh, the interests of the children to be more of a priority in, in those decisions. Lady Hale, Brenda Hale, thank you very much indeed for joining us and for sharing your ways to change the world. Thank you very much indeed. Our producer is Rachel Evans, and you can watch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Until next time, bye-bye.